But I read about a little boy. And uh, he went to bed. After he'd been in bed a while, mother heard a thud. Basically, she hollered at him. And uh, mother said, what happened? I fell out of bed. Are you all right? Yes. Why did you fall out of bed? I stayed too close to the place I got in. Ring a bell? I stayed too close to the place I got in. The subject today, to reign as kings in life or to reign as kings in death, is ours to choose. You say, well, we can reign as kings in life, but what's this reign as kings in death? There's multiple kingdoms that are that we have before us. That's strictly that. There's a prince of the power of the air of this world. There is the king of kings. He has a kingdom. Kingdom of and there is the kingdom of the world. I was talking this morning to someone and I said, now don't get caught up with this death. We, we tend to think of death as physical death. It's not the kind of death I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual death that ultimately starts now. Unless something happens, it will continue to go beyond the grave to eternal death, which is separation from God. But we have a choice. We can die in this life now by, having, by being nailed to the cross, and we can reign as kings in this life subject to the king of kings forever yet i wonder if we sometimes don't stay too close to the edge so to speak i've been captured in time gone by and mentioned it in times gone by the difference between these two kingdoms in one fashion is immeasurable okay Immeasurable. A statement was made when sin is removed and cast away, the, dis dif the distance between is immeasurable, or it says this way in Psalms 103 12. As far as the east is from the west, hath he removed our transgressions from us. Measure that. You can't. So, from the amplified versions, we, we're going to deal first with about four verses of Romans 5 15. Here he says, God's free gift is not at all to be compared to the trespass. Now, just a minute. God's free gift is not comparable to the trespass. Well, wait a minute. Aren't I just hanging out there? No. He took your sins an immeasurable distance away. An immeasurable distance away. The guilt and condemnation of that, he took an immeasurable distance away. Immeasurable. God's free gift is not at all to be compared to the trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. Out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse, his offense, much more profusely did God's Grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. So what we have here, the gift, the free gift, is not comparable to the trespass. It's not similar. They are contrasts, opposite ends of the spectrum. Unrelated. Get that? Unrelated. Nothing in common. Nothing in common. Hmm. See, don't stay too close to the edge. Don't know how else to say it. In English, the free gift is immeasurably greater than the offense. In English, again, incapable of being measured. Just to give you a perspective, 
Distance from the Earth to the Moon is approximately 239,000 miles. Light crosses it. Distance in a second. Measurable. The average distance from the Sun to the Earth is about 93 million miles. Light only takes about eight minutes to make the journey. Measurable. Got an idea? He took your sins out there somewhere. See, the above distance we can measure, we, we, we can measure but cannot measure the distance or the separation from the free gift to the trespass. Grab a hold of this. It's just not words. This thing get be functional, you'll see that the trespass has nothing to do with the free gift. When guilt or condemnation rears his ugly head, you're removed. Out there somewhere. I can't even measure the distance. Frankly, they're worlds apart, not comparable. Trespasses are not part of God's creation. God's grace abounds and overflows to all who call upon him or choose him. Your choice moves you into God's realm, God's world, God's kingdom. Say, I'm still here. You're in God's world, God's kingdom. And there's a world that you see. Is that right? Now, in Romans 5, 16 and 17, we come, nor is a free gift at all to be compared to the effect. See, the free gift is not comparable to the effect of sin. If I sense it anywhere near accurately, we sometimes think we're closely def- Righteousness and the effect of sin, death, is right here, running neck and neck. No! They're not right here. We're a kingdom apart. If we're right here, we're in one kingdom, in another kingdom. And then you decide which kingdom rules the other kingdom. Which kingdom rules? Which is the kingdom that rules? Which one are we more familiar with? Oops. Wow. The effect is the outward sign, the power to bring about the results or, it, or influence. The free gift, supernatural, uh, supernatural provision is not to be compared to the effect of one man's sin. For the sentence following the trespass of one man brought condemnation, judgment, and guilty. Whereas the free gift following many transgressions brings justification, an act of righteousness. Granting innocence. Don't stay too close to the edge. You see? Get in there. The free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin. The condemnation by Adam was for one sin. The justification by Christ is not only from the guilt of the first offense, but from the countless offenses of all humanity. He took to himself. Verse 17. If because of one man's offense, lapse, offense, trespass, death reigned through the one, much more surely, much more surely, 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 truly, truly, or in other words, a guarantee, will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, the free gift of righteousness, putting them into right standing with himself, will reign as kings in life through one man, Jesus Christ. You feel like you reign as a king? That's your inheritance, right? Much more surely. It's available. Much more. It's available. It's there. It's yours. It's delegated to us. It's handed to us. Just a minute, Lynn. No. That's what he keeps telling us in the word of God. We are not what we once was.
Nothing like it. We are a new species of being, a new identity with a new birth into another kingdom. Good work. Good work. Wow. So the two ideas of Romans 5, 15 and 16 is combined in this verse 17. The reign of sin and death, the reign of life, the trespass and free gift of which there is no comparison, of which the effects are nothing alike. Paul speaks of the, that life that springs out of justification to contrast with the death that springs from sin and that follows condemnation. He speaks in life in the terms of the widest sense, life in the whole man throughout the whole duration of human existence, the life of a blissful and loving relationship with God and the life of Christ imparted to his believers. This is the life Christians reign in. It is worthy of note that while he says death reigned over us through Adam, he does not say life reigns over us through Christ. It is a fact when we surrender to him, his life, his words, has, is the guiding principle of our life. But it's a reign where you have the ability to make choices, I would think your choice would be, I will follow him. I will. You see, then, well, life reigns in us. That would be an accurate statement. His life does reign in us. Yet, I think beyond this reigning, life is represented as a glorious territory and an atmosphere, a place of that reign. What, what are you trying to do here, Lynn? I went out and started looking, and I found some things that really is interesting. He transformed us to a, translated us to a glorious territory, an atmosphere of his own making, a place of his own choosing and making, as well as placing within us his life. His life. See, these are his choices. Now think about that. You're sitting here on a chair. It may move or it may be fixed or sets on something else. But we are a product in ourself of another community, another city, another place. And yet, how close do we identify with where we come from or the things around us? Wow. Mm-mm. You see, wow. If one man's offense let loose against us the tyrant power of death to hold us in as, as victims in helpless bondage, much more God's abounding grace in Christ makes possible our possessing a life divinely owed, legally secured, reigning in exultant freedom and unchallenged might through the matchless one, Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. Don't stay too close to the edge. All right? Sin reigns in death, grace reigns through righteousness. So in verse 21, so that just as sin has reigned in death, so grace, his unearned, undeserved favor, might reign through righteousness, right standing with God, which issues in eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, our Lord. Wow. Okay. It was grace that made him to be sin who knew no sin. Do we recognize that? It was grace. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way. For he hath made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of who? Of God. Your righteousness is, not, is, is, is imputed to you because you came to him for the forgiveness of sin. When he took your sin, he imparted to you his righteousness, God's righteousness. Wow. Can you say you're righteous? You can on this basis. It's not my righteousness, it's God's righteousness. Simply put. Wow. 
That's neat. See? The grace that makes us to be the righteousness of God in him so that we who receive abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, do reign in life by one Jesus Christ through righteousness. You won't find it at the edge of the place you got in. Ooh. Eternal life, so that we all are on the same page, is life in its highest form, for it is a life that God possesses and dispenses to his sons. This life is brought by Jesus Christ our Lord. We are to reign, rule, huh? king, from the root of another word, through the notion of a foundation of power, of a sovereign. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now, Vine says this, to reign of believers, so it's the reign of believers, where they shall reign in life, indicates the activity of life and fellowship with Christ in his sovereign power, reaching its fullness sometime hereafter. But in the meantime, it's still ours. Ah, to reign, the reign of divine grace, there's also a Romans 5.21, the reign of sin or the reign of righteousness. It is your choice. Or you can choose the reign of death. Mm. Today, the believer's citizenship is in where? Heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3.20 puts it this way. For our conversation, right there, that word conversation, is citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our citizenship is now. We still look future for the coming. In the meantime, our citizenship is still there. All right? You've been placed there. Our citizenship is heaven where the foundation and the builder and the maker is God. Hebrews 11.10. It's a better country prepared by God. 11.16. Hebrews 11, 12, 22 through 24. Look at this one. Read me those first few four words. Ye are what? Ye are, but ye are come. Ye are come. You are come. Okay. You are come. Uh, Marla. Teacher. Ye are come. Is that future? Ye are come. Is it past tense or now? In Greek, I'll tell you this. I'll take you off the hook. In the Greek, that is present tense. Ye are come now. Ye are come now unto Mount Zion. You say, well, Hello, I don't even know where it is and haven't looked at it. God knows where it is. He chose these words for a reason. Ye are come, present tense. Ye are come in the Greek, present tense, <coughs> to Mount Zion. It's a place, it is an atmosphere, it is a territory, it is the body, body of what? The body of Christ, the body of the church. It is the habitat of God, it is the household of God. Are you in it? You've come to Mount Zion. You're there. Even if you don't know where Mount Zion is, you've never been there. He put you there. Boy, yes. Unto the city of the living God. I haven't seen it. You will see it. Experience it. It flows in you. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Oh, I know that is coming in the future. And of an innumerable company of angels. Ye are come. Ye are come. Ye are come. I'm getting, I'm getting to the place where I talk, I talk, I, I, I won't involve him any more than I involve him. <laughs> <laughs> that gets me off the hook. I sat in his basement the other day. I said, Gary, sometimes there's shadows. <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's shadows. 
And those shadows don't scare you. They just kind of move. Now you suppose one of these days they're going to bust into full flavor? John G. Lake, I, will, I didn't plan on doing this, but he, he, had an old, he had an old sinner he was dealing with, an old sinner. We always old sinners. But this guy, he said, I see demons. I see them. And that's not uncommon. These people see them. I see them, he said. John, John prayed with him, got him straightened out. Now, he said to him, something I never heard anybody say to me, now, you've seen those demons, now go see angels. And he come back a few days later and he said, I didn't get down the street until I saw one. Now they're all over. Oh, wait a minute. They're there. You see them or don't see them. They're there. They're on assignment. Hello. Ye are come. Present tense. Ye are come in the present result of a past action. Wow. Today, the invisible, visible church, the body of Christ. Tomorrow, the new Jerusalem of prophecy on earth. The dwelling place of the living God is now, today, the church, in the future, the new Jerusalem. And any of those other words that you might have thought was there. Wow. I, this stuff is good stuff. Ooh. To the general assembly... The church of the firstborn, in verse 23, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the saints of just man made perfect. Mm. Enrolled as citizens, because our names are written. Enrolled already. Actually, they were enrolled before you were. Amen. Boy. <laughs> written in heaven, it's recorded. Ah. The God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just man made perfect. That's us. Our spirits are made perfect. Verse 24. And Jesus, the mediator of the New Testament, to the blood of sprinkling, has speaketh better things than that of Abel. The wages of this world is death and continual dying. The wages of life is God's life now. And forever. All we do is put off this mortal and put on immortality. That's not death, as our Lord describes it. Wow. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. I've just read them in King James. I want to read them now in Wes's uh, New Testament. Wes's. Ye have come to Mount Zion, even to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to a festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn. <laughs> Where are those? Who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the saints of just men who have been brought to completeness, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new testament, and to the blood of sprinkling, which speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. Let me share with you your transfer. Everybody remembers in Colossians 1, verse 13, we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. Let me share with you your transfer. By grace, God presented you with a choice of life or death. You chose life, new life via the new birth, which gave you new living conditions. You were translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You're now in a new kingdom, recognized as citizens. Now living with a heavenly constitution, with a new king who delegated his authority to you. Your wardrobe now includes his spiritual supernatural armor. You're now made complete in the Godhead, clothed with the same righteousness as the Godhead, the same righteousness that the heavenly throne sets on, the same righteousness that the heavenly throne is surrounded by. That's yours. That's how he sees you. Innocent. Innocent. No guilt, no condemnation, no judgment. 
Wow. Wow. Is your motor revved up? Recognize your transfer. Accept your new position and all you have already received. Stop looking for it in the future. It is a past happening from God's point of view. Wow. Wow. Glory. Thank you, Father. You've taken us and placed us in there. Amen. On the potato. Let it be manifest among us, to us, and through us. This is you. That's you who could be walking and talking with other people. We get to be your instrument. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. You rule and reign. Amen. You defeated the enemy of the other world. He's already defeated. Glory. Glory. Truth. It is. Dominion. I'm not going to define it today by Genesis 126. I'm going to define it by another scripture. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Can you sit there and say, sin will not have dominion over me. It does not. I don't belong in that country. I have another country. I have another city. It's an enduring city. Builder and maker is God. Has a foundation that's unshakable. Amen. Glory. Oh, for sin shall not have dominion, rule, or lordship over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Don't stay too close to the edge. Why? Dominion over sin is first. Right? Sin triumphed before. Grace will now be more than a conqueror or has dominion. Don't continue to make excuses for sin, but believe in dominion over sin. Wow. The law of life reigns over the law of sin and death. Remember, there's no comparison between the effects of life and death. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation, no judgment to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. I'd normally tell you there's a period there. And this last part of that verse picks up, is a part of verse 4. And you can go and read it there if you want. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, law, law, law. Law, a minute, hang on, has both control and the authority to enforce. Choose. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus brings control and the authority to enforce or sets you free from the law of sin and death. Got that? What has provided dominion over sin? Grace. Now the law of the spirit of life has past tense made you free or provided dominion, rule, lordship over the law of sin and grace or that which rules the other world. Sin and sin, death rules the other world. Let me make that clear. All right? I've told you this story and probably most of you have read it. I'm just going to keep it as brief as I can get it because it's one of the best illustrations of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus setting you free from the law of sin and death. But I need some help. John G. Lake went to where the plague. Somebody say that in the big outside voice. If I say it. You find it. Thank you. (laughs) 
My wife says, you say boo. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a reason. Boo it fits it in the measure. Anyhow, all the medical teams where they was ministering were dying or had negative effects. A whole other team came and was, came to John G. Lake and said, what is your secret? You must have a secret why your team is not affected by this sickness. He said, well, it's not a secret. It's this. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Well, what do you mean? Well, you got a microscope. He says there's a bloody froth when these people die. It comes to their mouth. It's just full of the germs. He says, look at it. Sure enough, it was. Now he says, put it in my hand, or they placed it in his hand. And in his hand, they died under the microscope. Why? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set him free from the law of sin and death. That kills him. Best illustration I've ever heard. It reminded me. Angela gave me a, a book, and I read it again. Wow. I'd like to close this morning by going to a couple of scriptures out of John. One, three of them are in the 17th chapter. One is in 1 John 4. But John 17, 4, 14, excuse me, 17, 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. And you, that's more real in Houston today than it probably is in Big Rapids. It's more real in other parts of the world where people are being slain, persecuted, because they're Christians and won't deny him. But I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. That's you. That's you. That's me. Look at here, though. Even as. Even as. I. I'm not of this world. He's in the world with you. Even as. Wow. 16. He wants you to get this. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Did you get it this time? He repeats it. Even as I am not of the world. We get so distraught with the things of the world when we actually are functioning from a world or a kingdom that supersedes the world we live in. I haven't seen it. Don't live close to the edge. You say, are you bringing guilt? Not intentional. I'm recommending that we don't live close to the edge. Don't live there. Wow. Verse 18. Look at how he sends you to the world. As thou, he's talking to his disciples here. And just a couple verses beyond this, he says, I also include all those that's going to come after. So here he is. This all this works for you. As thou hast sent me, verse, into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. Did he come capable? I ask you, did Jesus come capable? Did John come capable? Did the disciples come capable? They had the same decisions to make as you and I. Yet we elevate them to some place and status that is not. Is, no. They put their shoes on like I do. Like you do. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them. Even so have I sent them. Even so have I sent them. I don't care what your set of circumstances are. Even so, he sent you. Even so. Wow. Herein, in 1 John 4, 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, because, why? Because, as he is, so are we 
in this world. I haven't seen it. Gary and I was talking. And I, I can't remember how I expressed it to him. If you remember, you tell me if it don't come back in the next 30 seconds or so. But we was talking about, he asked how Tony was, and we went back in time. And, and as you stand outside the room and the crash cart's there, and, and they just give your daughter a shot. It's going to stop her heart to restart it again. And you're just looking in the room. And you stand there at peace, at calm. And I told Gary, it wasn't because we lack feelings. It's because I could not let go of what we're hanging on to. A fact from another world ministering to a fact in this world. You see, I expect you're going to use that mental thing in the future. Can I borrow it back for a moment? <laughs> he said, no. He was talking about his Sunday school class that's coming up. And he says, this man walked, had this job to do, and there was giants. A thing, as we find giants in that world, we cannot allow the giants of that world to be giants in our world. Or we cannot allow them to be giants of our own making in our head when he says, as I am and was in the world, so are you in the world. As I am, so are you. Wow. Because as he is, so are we in this world. You say, he'd have stood there unshakable. Absolutely. As he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Don't say that. We can, that's enough. Wow. Whew. Father, these are your words. Sometimes strong words, nonetheless. Your words. We don't want to stay next to the edge. We want to be out there in your kingdom, experiencing the divine flow, experiencing the peace, the joy, and the contentment, the confidence, and the assurance has found in your righteousness. We can look at Isaiah 32 and see that there is an effect in our ministry of righteousness and peace. Issues, confidence, and assurance forever. We don't have to leave it. We don't have to let it flee away or melt away or, or become deluded. It is a living reality and may we enjoy that reality this day, in this place, in this time. The time is now. The time is now. No more do we wait. The time is now. Because you said it's now. We have come unto Mount Zion. We have come. Have come. Thank you. We've come. We're in the city of the living God. Amen. In the community, in the nation, in the commonwealth, in the, in the whatever place that people look for you or words that you use to describe the place in the body of Christ. The household and the habitat of God. We are there. We desire to function from there. Always function from there. not staying at the edge. Thank you. We give you praise.
honor and glory. This is what your book says, and we honor you and your word. You magnified it above your name. All of glory. I think that's the 138th Psalm, about verse 2, somewhere in there. Thank you. It's there indelibly written on the pages of your book. To last forever. With absolute certainty. Praise, honor, and glory is given to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We got time to pray.